call to worship this morning is Psalm 117. O praise the Lord, all ye nations, praise him, all ye people, for his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Let us ask God's blessing on our worship this morning in a moment of silent prayer. congregation in our Lord Jesus Christ. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from Jesus Christ our Lord through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We turn in our Psalters to number 251. 251. Joyful worship. We'll sing the three stanzas, all three of 251. Thank you.
God this morning from Exodus 20. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. First, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Second, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Third, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Fourth, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Fifth, honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Sixth, thou shalt not kill. Seventh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Eighth, thou shalt not steal. Ninth, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And tenth, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Our Lord instructed us in the heart of that law in Matthew 22, in response to the question, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We turn in our Psalters again now to 432, Psalter number 432. We sing of God's covenant. Stanza three, Jacob's seed he'll never from his covenant sever. The four stanzas, all four of 432.
this time we turn to the form for the administration of baptism found on page 86 in the back of the Psalter. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the principal parts of the doctrine of holy baptism are these three. First, that we with our children are conceived and born in sin, and therefore are children of wrath in so much that we cannot enter into the kingdom of God except we are born again. This the dipping in or sprinkling with water teaches us, whereby the impurity of our souls is signified, and we admonished to loathe and humble ourselves before God and seek for our purification and salvation without ourselves. Secondly, holy baptism witnesseth and sealeth unto us the washing away of our sins through Jesus Christ. Therefore we are baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. For when we are baptized in the name of the Father, God the Father witnesseth and sealeth unto us that he doth make an eternal covenant of grace with us, and adopts us for his children and heirs, and therefore will provide us with every good thing, and avert all evil, or turn it to our profit. And when we are baptized in the name of the Son, the Son sealeth unto us that he doth wash us in his blood from all our sins, incorporating us into the fellowship of his death and resurrection, so that we are freed from all our sins and accounted righteous before God. In like manner, when we are baptized in the name of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost assures us by this holy sacrament that he will dwell in us and sanctify us to be members of Christ, applying unto us that which we have in Christ, namely the washing away of our sins and the daily renewing of our lives, till we shall finally be presented without spot or wrinkle among the assembly of the elect in life eternal. Thirdly, whereas in all covenants there are contained two parts, therefore are we by God through baptism admonished of and obliged unto new obedience, namely that we cleave to this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that we trust in him and love him with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our mind, and with all our strength, that we forsake the world, crucify our old nature, and walk in a new and holy life. And if we sometimes through weakness fall into sin, We must not, therefore, despair of God's mercy, nor continue in sin, since baptism is a seal and undoubted testimony that we have an eternal covenant of grace with God. And although our young children do not understand these things, we may not, therefore, exclude them from baptism. For as they are, without their knowledge, partakers of the condemnation in Adam, so are they again received unto grace in Christ. As God speaketh unto Abraham, the father of all the faithful, and therefore unto us and our children, Genesis 17, verse 7, saying, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. This also the Apostle Peter testifieth with these words, Acts 2, verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Therefore God formerly commanded them to be circumcised, which was a seal of the covenant and of the righteousness of faith. And therefore Christ also embraced them, laid his hands upon them, and blessed them. Mark 10. Since then, baptism is come in the place of circumcision. Therefore, infants are to be baptized as heirs of the kingdom of God and of his covenant. And parents are in duty bound further to instruct their children herein when they shall arrive to years of discretion. That therefore this holy ordinance of God may be administered to his glory, to our comfort, and to the edification of his church. Let us call upon his holy name. O Almighty and Eternal God, Thou who hast, according to Thy severe judgment, punished the unbelieving and unrepentant world with the flood, and hast, according to Thy great mercy, saved and protected believing Noah and his family. 
Thou who hast drowned the obstinate Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, and hast led thy people Israel through the midst of the sea upon dry ground, by which baptism was signified, we beseech thee that thou wilt be pleased of thine infinite mercy graciously to look upon these children and incorporate them by thy Holy Spirit into thy Son, Jesus Christ, that they may be buried with him into his death and be raised with him in newness of life, that they may daily follow him, joyfully bearing their cross, and cleave unto him in true faith, firm hope, and ardent love, that they may, with a comfortable sense of thy favor, leave this life, which is nothing but a continual death, and at the last day may appear without terror before the judgment seat of Christ thy Son, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with thee and the Holy Ghost, one only God, lives and reigns forever. Amen. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have heard that baptism is an ordinance of God to seal unto us and to our seed his covenant. Therefore, it must be used for that end and not out of custom or superstition, that it may then be manifest that you are thus minded, you are to arise and answer sincerely to these questions. First, whether you acknowledge that although our children are conceived and born in sin and therefore are subject to all miseries, yea, to condemnation itself, yet that they are sanctified in Christ, and therefore, as members of his church, ought to be baptized. Secondly, whether you acknowledge the doctrine which is contained in the Old and New Testaments and in the articles of the Christian faith and which is taught here in this Christian church to be the true and perfect doctrine of salvation. And thirdly, whether you promise and intend to see this child when come to the years of discretion, instructed and brought up in the aforesaid doctrine or help or cause him to be instructed therein to the utmost of your power. Mr. and Mrs. Greg Kelsbeek, what is your answer? Yes. Leland James, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. With thanksgiving to God now, we'll sing Psalter 425, stanzas 4 and 5. God's name in congregational prayer. 
Almighty God and merciful Father, we thank and praise Thee that Thou hast forgiven us and our children all our sins through the blood of Thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and received us through Thy Holy Spirit as members of Thine only begotten Son, and adopted us to be Thy children, and sealed and confirmed the same unto us by holy baptism. We beseech thee through the same Son of thy love that thou wilt be pleased always to govern these baptized children by thy Holy Spirit, that they may be piously and religiously educated, increase and grow up in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they then may acknowledge thy fatherly goodness and mercy which thou hast shown to them and us, and live in all righteousness under our only teacher, King, and High Priest, Jesus Christ, and manfully fight against and overcome sin, the devil, and his whole dominion, to the end that they may eternally praise and magnify Thee, and Thy Son, Jesus Christ, together with the Holy Ghost, the one only true God. We thank Thee, Father, for this day of rest, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in which we may, according to thy mercy and grace, hear from thy mouth the good news and glad tidings of our reconciliation with thee through Jesus Christ, so that we who by nature are enemies and aliens from thy family and thy people have been brought near unto thee by thy sovereign work and according to thy perfect will, that we have been delivered from our sin and death by the obedience of Jesus Christ, that we have been adopted as thy own sons and daughters and made members of thy own covenant family. The knowledge of this is for us so wonderful and so high that we can hardly fathom it, that we should be thy children, that we should be brought into thy covenant, that we should have thy spirit, that we should be members of Jesus Christ. It is a great, great thing that thou hast done. We are sorry, Father, for all of our ingratitude and our hardness to thee and to thy gospel, for all of our all of our departure and rebellion from thy truth. We pray, Father, that thou wilt look upon us in mercy and not deal with us according to our sins, nor reward us according to our iniquities. But deal with us as thou always hast in thy everlasting mercy and in thy sovereign saving grace. We pray, Father, that thou wilt teach us who are by nature unteachable, that thou wilt soften us who are by nature hard, shed abroad thy spirit, give to us thy spirit that thy love may be shed abroad in our hearts that we may hear the Holy Gospel and find in that Gospel rest and peace. We thank Thee, Father, for what Thou dost give in our salvation and in the building of Thy Church. We thank Thee for the sacrament of baptism this morning. We thank Thee for the gift of a daughter to Seth and Jessica yesterday. We thank Thee for the confession of faith and membership of Taylor this evening. We thank Thee for the membership of Luke and Emily and their family. We thank Thee for Thy care of our sick and afflicted, for the comfort and peace that Thou dost give by Thy word. We thank Thee for the peace of mind that Thou dost give to those who are troubled. Thou art very, very good. Thou art so good. 
Uh, we cannot help but tremble in awe and love and gratitude for what thou hast done. And so may we hear thy blessed gospel this day. May we hear our Savior and hear of his work to give us his spirit who unites us to him and brings to us all his things. We pray, Father, that thou wilt knit us together as a congregation and knit us together as a denomination that all of the division, the wicked division, that there has been may be removed, that we may stand together upon thy truth and stand together in the unity of the covenant and the love of the covenant and the unity and communion of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that thou wilt strengthen thy servant today, that he may bring thy word faithfully according to the scriptures and not his own. We pray, Father, that thou wilt grant that we may hear in faith and be fed and nourished unto everlasting life. We pray that thou wilt be with our elders, giving unto them wisdom for their rule. And as the office of elder has been restored to our churches in this past week, by the decisions of classes which thy spirit has led the churches to declare, for so it seemed good to thy spirit. And because it seemed good to thy spirit, it seemed good to the churches. We pray, Father, that thou wilt bless our elders in their rule, that thou wilt give to them the word of Christ, Thou wilt give unto them strength for the opposition that they face, that they may be able in that opposition to stand, to stand upon the truth and to bring and apply that truth. And may they, as under shepherds among the flock, go in and out to the comfort and salvation of thy people. Remember our deacons, in their administering mercies to those in need, give unto them a comfortable word of the gospel to bring to those who, who suffer, even as they provide the mercies of Christ for the relief of thy poor. We pray, Father, that thou wilt bless our worship now, that it might be to the glory of thy name, and for the good of the congregation and the feeding of the congregation, we pray, Father, that thou wilt sustain us by thy grace, that thou wilt give to us the joy and comfort of our salvation. Hear our prayer, wilt thou forgive all our sins, remembering also, Father, among us the member who is under discipline and who is hardened and impenitent in that sin. We pray, Father, that thou wilt soften the member's heart and deliver the member from hell and death through the gospel of Jesus Christ unto life and peace. And forgive all our sins. Teach us to fear. For we know, Father, that the man who thinketh that he standeth must take heed lest he fall. Forgive our sins, Father, who are the chief of sinners, blotting them out in Jesus' blood. And keep us from sin that we might serve thee in thought, word, and deed, and that we might love thee and love one another, and this to the glory of thy name. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. We worship the Lord now in the giving of our offerings. The first offering is for the general fund and the second is for benevolence.
Psalter number 151, 151. We'll sing the six stanzas, all six of 151. God's word this morning to Acts 4. Acts chapter 4. Acts 4 picks up the history of the healing of the lame man by Peter and John outside of the temple so that that lame man went walking and leaping 
and praising God and all of the people were astonished and asked how this thing could be done. And Peter and John preached the gospel of Jesus Christ that by the power of the name of Christ, through faith in that name, which name is the gospel and the truth, that man was healed. And we pick up the uh, history of that in Acts 4. And as they, that is Peter and John, as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now even tide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about five thousand. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above forty years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. and They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, And they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things common. 
and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joses, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is the word of God, holy and inspired. May he bless it to our hearts this morning. Our text is verses 31 and 32. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Beloved congregation in our Lord Jesus Christ, with regard to the text, verses 31 and 32, the Church of Jesus Christ faces a critical question. And the question is whether that text is a historical note for the Church or whether that text is a gospel promise for the Church. If the text is a historical note, then that means that the church is being given a brief history lesson that allows us to look back in time and see the way things were in a different era and in a different time than we live in today so that we can have a little glimpse into the life of the early New Testament church and take note of the way things were for that early New Testament church. But then that's as far as that historical note goes. And the church must be careful in that historical note not to take that text as something that we must expect today or that we must follow today. And there are many who would caution you even to take the text as a historical note. There are many who look at the life of the early New Testament church revealed here, the life of each man saying that whatever he has is not his own, and the life of having all things in common. And they warn the church today, well, that's not for you. That's not for you. That was just for them. That was a special time in the life of the church. It's a time that got to be reduplicated in the life of the church that was a special time for them but not for you Uh, if that's my fault let me know what to do we'll we'll carry on and see if see if it's fixed so they say that that's a special time in the life of the church and that that's not for you and in fact there's the warning that you must not try to have today a system based on what you read here. There may be no community of goods in the church today. There may be no appeal to this text for an economic system in a nation of all goods being the property of all men, a kind of communism or a kind of socialism. This text is held up as a historical note for a special time, and the warning is, now don't try to reduplicate that. And the Reformed Church has to reckon with the fact that we reject a community of goods. We reject that as a great evil. The Church of Jesus Christ, the Reformed Church of Jesus Christ, detests seditious people, not merely the errors of seditious people, who try to withdraw from the society 
and introduce a community of goods among men, we don't just detest that error, we detest the people who do that. We detest the Anabaptists and other seditious people who reject the rule of the state and who introduce a community of goods. Reformed churches do that. They reject that. And so there are those who would take this text and now make it a warning. This is only historical note. It's all you may see in this. That's wrong. This text is not merely a historical note. This text is a gospel promise. It is the promise of what God has done for you. It is the promise of what God gives you in his grace and on the basis of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the text doesn't teach a community of goods. That's the genius of the Reformed faith, which is the gospel, the genius of the Holy Spirit who reveals these things. The text does not teach a community of goods. The text teaches the covenant. That's the doctrine of the text. It's the covenant. It's the union of the people of God with Jesus Christ. The communion of the people of God with Jesus Christ. And in their communion with him, their union and communion with each other. So that the people of God are of one heart. The people of God are of one soul together. Because of the spirit of Christ who unites us to him and therefore unites us to each other. That's the gospel promise of the text. It's the promise of the covenant. The promise of covenant union with Christ and covenant fellowship one with another. And you know that this text is a gospel promise to the church by this sacrament of baptism. What is the doctrine of holy baptism? What is that doctrine as we read it this morning? that when you are baptized in the name of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost witnesseth and sealeth unto you that he will dwell with you, that he will make you members of Christ. That's the text. There was an earthquake, and the Holy Ghost filled them all, dwelled with them all, and dwelling with them all made them of one heart and of one soul together. That's the gospel promise of the text. And God has done that. This congregation and this denomination is a different denomination today than it was last week. You can mark it on Thursday and Friday of this week at the meeting of classes the denomination became a different denomination by Friday night than it was on Thursday morning. On Thursday morning, there was division. The division was shocking. The division was that there were men attacking the covenant of grace. Attacking the covenant of grace. There was confusion and tension God, the Holy Spirit, came according to the promise of Jehovah God, the gospel promise of God. The Holy Spirit blowing like a wind through the classes gave the classes the truth of the gospel to stand upon, the truth of the covenant. Gave the classes the boldness to stand upon that truth. And by that blowing of the Spirit and bringing of the Gospel caused the churches to be united with one heart and with one soul. That was a wondrous work of the grace of God. That was a wondrous fulfillment of the Gospel promise. And that's the wondrous work that the Church of Jesus Christ rejoices in as the work of her Savior.
the work of her God. And so at the occasion of baptism where that promise is made, we rejoice in that work and hear this word of God under the theme of one heart and of one soul. In the first place, consider the meaning. In the second place, consider the communion. And in the third place, consider the boldness of one heart and of one soul, the meaning, the communion, and the boldness. The Church of Jesus Christ met together in the text with a terrible threat hanging over their heads. And that terrible threat that hung over their heads was the threat of the false church that they must not preach in the name of Jesus. They may not speak that name. The false church would like to have killed them. The most it could do was imprison them for a night. The most it could do was haul them before the judges and threaten them not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore, to be silent about the gospel. But the false church would have liked to kill them because of the people. They couldn't yet. They had to build to that in their persecution. And so all they could do was threaten them, but that was a terrible threat. And when the church of Jesus Christ gathered with that threat hanging over their heads, their response was to rejoice. The name of Jesus had been preached. The gospel of salvation, which reveals the heart, the will, the counsel of God, and the great work and power of God in saving his people through Jesus Christ. That gospel had been preached. They didn't have to be embarrassed of it. They didn't have to be ashamed of it. They could stand upon it. And now they're gathered with the church. And Peter and John report what happened with the imprisonment and with the trial before the leaders of the false church. And the whole church rejoices. The whole church is glad that the name of Jesus was proclaimed. They pray in that truth. Thank God in that truth. Ask God that that gospel might continue to go forth with power. That congregation of the people of God was visited by God as the Holy Spirit came upon them and filled them. That's the explanation of their union in one heart and one soul. Their union of one heart and one soul was not this, that they had strong emotions for each other. They had a real affection in their heart for one another. It wasn't their emotional state with regard to each other. But rather their one heart and their one soul was this, that God came and lived in them together. The Holy Spirit came and entered into their hearts, filled their heart and filled their soul. Not that they had been unregenerated, not that they had been unbelieving, but the Holy Spirit came to them in covenant fellowship and covenant communion. And oh yes, the Holy Spirit came to them. The Holy Spirit brought to them the covenant fellowship of Jehovah God himself. And the Holy Spirit came to them in a mighty earthquake. As they sat in that room, the believers together, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. That's how God comes. He comes in an earthquake. He comes and he shakes the foundations under the feet of man so that man might know there is no foundation in man. There is no earthly foundation upon which he can stand and that his foundation must be Jehovah God and Jesus Christ, the rock, and the gospel of salvation alone. The foundation of man must be the bulwarks and the towers of the truth of the gospel. 
The Holy Spirit does that yet today. He comes with earthquakes. Not in the sense that this room or this property is going to shake under our feet. But he certainly comes with earthquakes where he shakes the church and shows them that all of their foundation in man must be swept away. He does that in the preaching of the gospel. The preaching of the gospel is an earthquake. The preaching of the gospel makes you nothing. It makes me nothing. That's an earthquake. There's nothing under your feet of man that can hold you up. There's only Christ, only his gospel, only the everlasting God. The Holy Spirit came to them through that earthquake and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. The Holy Spirit came to the hearts of those people. The Holy Spirit made their hearts his own dwelling place, his own temple. You can think of it this way, of your own heart as a great cavern. Your own heart as one of those enormous caves and caverns that you can find in the earth, Carlsbad Caverns or Mammoth Caves or some such thing. That's your heart. That's your heart. And each of God's people has a heart that can be thought of as that enormous cave. And the Holy Spirit enters into that heart as his own dwelling. And when the Holy Spirit enters He does not enter the surface merely so that he stands outside your heart and even surrounds your heart and calls into your heart. He comes right into your heart. He enters down the long shafts of your heart and enters into the recesses and crevices of the heart. The Holy Spirit fills that heart and dwells with you in that spiritual center of your being. That Holy Spirit abiding with you in that spiritual center of your being in your heart brings with him Christ. Brings with him Christ's word. Brings with him the good news of salvation. So that you know Jehovah God is your God. You know in your heart that he is your God. That spirit witnesses in your heart that he is your God. That's why you cry out, Abba, Father. It's not because the spirit is outside your heart. Telling you something into your heart. That then you can know and say, the Holy Spirit goes into your heart. And by that Spirit, in your heart, you cry, Abba, Father. So that you can say it's the Spirit crying, Abba, Father. The Spirit of Jehovah, the Spirit of Christ, enters into the heart of His people. And that Holy Spirit, who is God, loves Himself. He loves God. He beholds God as the God of all beauty and all grace. And the Holy Spirit would know. The Holy Spirit would know that God is the God of all beauty and grace, for He is God not only, but that Spirit searcheth searcheth the deep things of God. The Spirit knows the infinite depths of the heart of God. The Spirit knows all the thoughts of the heart of God. He searches them. And knows them and understands them in all their infinite depth. The Spirit who dwells in your heart loves God. The Spirit loves the gospel. The Spirit loves the truth. He loves the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who came to save his people. 
That's what's going on in your heart. Where the Spirit dwells. That's why when you hear the Gospel, you're moved spiritually by it. You love God. Love Jesus Christ. And are comforted and consoled by that Gospel. That's the Spirit in your heart. And that Spirit that is in your heart, giving you all of the things of Christ. That spirit is in the heart of your neighbor, your brother in the church. He's giving him all those things too. The comfort, the peace, the knowledge of God, he gives to them. That's what it means the believers who were gathered there were of one heart. The Spirit filled them. The Spirit brought Christ to them. And the Spirit uniting them to Christ united them to one another in one heart. And they were of one soul. And whereas the heart now is the spiritual center of a man, out of which all the springs of that man flow, the soul refers to that inner life of a man. The inner life of a man in his thinking, the inner life of a man in his willing, that whole inner psychical, soulish life of a man. And the Holy Spirit entered into their souls as well. So that that whole inner life was directed by their heart and the Spirit's dwelling in their heart and the thoughts that they had of love for God and the will that they had to do Father's will. That was all the work of the Spirit. The child of God has that life of his soul and has that life of the inner man because of that spirit. That also explains the tremendous battle, that inner battle that the child of God has. For that child of God who has the spirit dwelling in his heart and giving him the thought after God, the truth, that man also has a totally depressed nature, an old man of sin. That old man of sin is his corruption, his total depravity. That old man of sin doesn't love God. That old man of sin doesn't love the truth. And that old man of sin never gets better. He remains corrupt so that there is tremendous warfare even in the life of the child of God himself. The good that I would, I do not. The evil that I would not, that I do. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul in Romans 7. The Spirit of Christ entered the heart of God's people and moving the inner life of God's people gave them that together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. What are we dealing with here? We're dealing with this, the covenant. That's what's being described, the covenant. When the Holy Spirit makes his dwelling with a man, that's the covenant. That's the fellowship of that man with Jehovah God. It's the covenant of the Spirit who is the Spirit of Christ taking that man and uniting that man to Christ so that that man is a member of the body of Christ. One plant and one organism with Christ. That's the covenant. That's the fellowship of the covenant. It is the Spirit giving to that man the knowledge of all the things of God. The knowledge of the perfect, finished work of Christ. That knowledge of all the things of God is life eternal. To know God 
And to know Christ is eternal life, which is another way of saying the covenant, the communion and the fellowship of the covenant. That was the promise at baptism that God makes to all his elect children. The promise is this, I will be your God, I'll be yours, and you will be my people. And all my things I give to you, which things I give in the Son, Jesus Christ. And I dwell with you by the Holy Spirit and make you members of Christ that you may live with him. That's what we're dealing with in this gift of the Holy Spirit that God gives to his church. And that makes us of one heart and of one soul. Now all of that covenant fellowship is according to the truth of Jehovah God. That too is evident in the passage. All of this has to do with the name of Jesus Christ. That's what chapters 3 and 4 were all about, the name of Jesus Christ. That's what Peter and John preached to the lame man in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That was the sermon that Peter and John preached to all the people who wondered what had happened. The name of Jesus Christ through faith in his name hath made this man whole. That was the concern of the chief priests and the scribes Stop preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. They were grieved that the name of Jesus had been mentioned and preached. When the disciples came together again, they rejoiced that the name of Jesus had been proclaimed. It's all about the name of Jesus Christ. What is the name of Christ? The name of Christ is his truth. It's his revelation. The name of Christ isn't a mere handle. The name of Jesus Christ is the gospel. It is the revelation of all the work of Christ. It's the revelation of the identity of Christ. So that preaching the name of Christ means preaching the holy gospel. It means preaching the truth. The Spirit doesn't work apart from that. The Holy Spirit works with the truth and the name of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, when he blows, as a wind in the church blows the truth of the gospel into the church. When he penetrates the recesses of the heart of a man, he brings the gospel into that heart of a man. So that whatever the capacity of that man is now, whatever the capacity, whether much or little, the Holy Spirit brings the knowledge of God into that heart of a man. The truth of the gospel into that heart of a man. The Holy Spirit is the breath of God that carries the word of God just as your breath is what carries your word out of your mouth into the world. And when that Holy Spirit brings that word of God it's not like a tornado that rips through the land and leaves behind it a path of destruction, that leaves behind it a trail. When the Holy Spirit brings that gospel, he brings it as that summer breeze that blows across a field of grass without ceasing. So that you see now the green top of the blade and now the silver underbelly of the blade. Again and again and again the breeze and wind blowing across that grass without ceasing. Causing the blades of that grass to float in its breeze. That's the way the Holy Spirit works. You can see that in the preaching of the gospel when you come to church it's not like a tornado blasts your heart into smithereens. But that word of the Spirit comes 
and lifts your heart, brings the gospel into that heart, and continues there and blows there with that gospel all your days. That's the Holy Spirit in his coming upon the church. That's his bringing Christ to the church by that holy gospel of God so that it's the Spirit that makes that gospel effectual and effective and, and powerful to save you from your sin and your death and to comfort you in the midst of all of your misery. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that means then, too, that when the Holy Spirit blows in the hearts of God's elect people and brings the truth in the hearts of elect people that also makes a division, hides some off from the assembly. Because the Holy Spirit works by the truth. Not all men love the truth. Men reject the truth. They hate that truth. And the explanation of their hatred of the truth and rejection of the truth is that the Spirit has not blown in their heart to give them the love of that truth. The Holy Spirit has not illuminated them to see that truth and to know God according to that truth. The blindness of their own deceit and conceit. That happened in Acts 3 and 4. The Holy Spirit came in that earthquake. The Holy Spirit filled them all and made them of one heart and of one soul. But there were many who wanted nothing to do with that. The false church threatened them. Stop that. We don't want to hear the name of Christ. You must be quiet about the name of Christ. You must not preach in the name of Christ. Don't bring us that word. Don't bring us that truth. We will not have it. And that division must be sought ultimately over God himself. In his counsel, and decree of election and reprobation, eternal predestination, so that when the truth is brought to some, they're hardened by it. The ultimate explanation of their hardening is God and reprobation. And that means when the truth is brought to you, and you're softened by it and saved by it, then you mustn't say about that, well, I did something in order to be soft to the truth and to receive the truth. You mustn't say that. The only thing you can say is this. This is God's counsel of election. This is God's counsel unfolded in the giving of the Spirit to me. So that that truth which is otherwise anathema to me, that truth which otherwise I hate, that gospel of Jesus Christ, that he has accomplished all things, that gospel saved me. Because the Spirit to me blew in my heart. And I say to all who hear the truth of the gospel, Do not harden yourselves as you hear that truth. Do not become obstinate against that truth, against that gospel. Submit yourself 
to that gospel. And when you submit, you say, ah, but the Spirit did that. Thank, thank God and thank Jesus Christ for his Spirit that did that according to his own good pleasure and will. And the church of Jesus Christ having that spirit and being of one heart and of one soul in that spirit and in that truth had blessed communion together in that spirit. That communion is described this way, neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. That passage does not teach a community of goods. The Reformed faith is an enemy of a community of goods. We detest those who try to institute a community of goods. But rather the teaching that no one said aught that the things that he had were his own but that they had all things in common is that men saw that what God had given them, he had not given them independently of their brother. And that when the brother had need, whatever that need might be, that what God had done must be used for the service of the other. That was their communion of having all things together. It did not mean this, that they all sell all of their things and have no more of their things, that they set up a communistic economy among the church. But it meant this, what God has given me, he has not given me independent of my brother. I have one heart with him and one soul with him by the Spirit of Christ. And when my brother has this need or that need, then my things are for him. Now what are we talking about here? The covenant. That's what that is. It's the covenant in its manifestation in the church, in the life of the church. The fellowship of Jehovah God with his people in Christ by which he unites us as members of Jesus Christ and in doing so unites us as members together with one heart and one soul so that the things he gives to me I don't hold an independence from my brother. That's the covenant in its manifestation. That's the covenant in its life. And that comes right out of the gospel. It comes right out of it. Who does it sound like when you read that neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own? That sounds like Christ. That's what Christ said. He never said about aught, about any of the things that he owned. That's for me only. Christ said about all of the things he possessed, I have that for them. I have that for my people. All his power, all his divine power was for you. All his perfect work was for you. All his perfect righteousness was for you. All his perfect obedience to every command of God was for you. Even his glory. Even his glory is for you. He prays in John 17 that he, he wills that you be with him where he is, that you may see his glory. That you may delight in it and enjoy it forever. That's what Christ said about what that he owned, all that he owned. I have this, 
not independently of my people, but I have this for them, for their salvation, for their good. That's the covenant in its life. It flows right out of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The communion of Christ with his people by his spirit is the explanation for the communion of the people of God with one another. That's what we didn't see at the beginning of the week last week that we see now with regard to the Christian school. That was the reformation that God worked this past week. All the discussions leading up to classes and in the meeting of classes, the Christian school was reestablished in the covenant The Christian school arises out of that covenant. And we didn't even know how deep the independentism went. This is how deep it went that we said about our children, those are my children. Well, what's so bad about that? That whole debate about the Christian school was framed in terms of parents' fight against the state, for example. I have my home, and when the state comes, and it's going to come someday and try to take away my children, when the state comes and said those are then my response to the state was, no, they're not your children's state, they're my children. That's wrong. Oh, it's it's right that our children aren't the states. Absolutely not. And if the state ever comes to you and said, those children are my children, you say to the state, no, they're not. They're not your children. But our error was in the answer when we said, they're my children. And when we taught that the school is the extension of the home, which it is, and the extension of the family, which it is, and that parents labor together in the rearing of their children, which they do, that the extension of the home and family all meant, but those children belong to me. That's the independentism. Saying of what that we have, have been given by God, that's mine. And I have that independently from the rest of you. So that ultimately, I say about my children what I want for them, and you have nothing to say to me about that. Hands off to you with regard to my children. That's the independentism. That's how deep it went. The truth of the matter is this. They're not your children. They're not the states. In a certain sense, we say they're not even the churches. They're God's. That's the covenant. They're God's children. So that the answer to the state that says they're my children is this. No, they're not your children. They're God's children. And therefore I must rear them as God has said. And when it comes to our life together in the church of Jesus Christ with one heart and with one soul, we don't say even about our children, which God has given to us, but those are mine alone. And I'm independent from you in the rearing of those children. But we say even with regard to those children, and then with regard to the teachers, and then with regard to the institutions and the schools, we say we have that in common. Out of the life of the covenant, out of God's covenant with us, who has given us these children, we labor together in the rearing of them. That's the covenant applied to the school. That's why the Christian school is a demand of the covenant, a requirement of the covenant. Not as a condition, never as a condition, but as the inevitable fruit 
of the covenant of God with believers and their seed who makes us of one heart and of one soul. The Lord Jesus Christ that filled his church, that fills his church, gives to the church great boldness in the speaking of the word. That was true among the church then. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. That's what the Spirit does. He gives the church boldness. The opposite of that is that the church becomes timid. The church becomes intimidated by all the pressures of all of the attacks upon that truth so that the church becomes uh, without any confidence in bringing the word. The church begins to question whether that's really the truth or not. When false doctrine is introduced, then the church is all confused And those who would bring the word boldly must be silenced. You may say it that strongly. Don't be so mean in how you say these things. There's an intimidation against the gospel. And because man hates that God is the ultimate authority, that intimidation begins with election and reprobation. And begins with everything that's tied to it. Justification by faith alone. Sanctification as the work of the Holy Spirit of Christ alone. That's where the intimidation begins. Don't say those things. You make people afraid or you make them upset. There's intimidation that's brought against the Word. But the Spirit of Jesus Christ, bringing that Word of the Gospel to His church, gives her great boldness to speak the Word. And if a man says, you mayn't say that, and you sin, I charge you with sin if you say that, the church must say, no, with boldness, I will speak this word, and you must submit to it too. It's the word of God. Where did we expect that intimidation to come from? We always expect it to come from outside. Always expect that. We did that when we were in mother. We thought the intimidation would come from outside. We do it now. We think the intimidation will come from outside. That intimidation will come from within. It will come from the members of the church. It will come from the corrupt office bearers in the church. It will. It always comes from within. And to that intimidation, the church says, that's enough. That's enough. We won't hear any more of that. This is the Jesus. We will preach boldly. We will speak boldly. And that boldness in speaking the word of God is the gift of the Spirit. It is his gift. No man can be bold in the gift of his own. That boldness is the gift of the Spirit who's not ashamed of the gospel. The Spirit is not intimidated by men. That Spirit bringing that gospel to his church gives her great boldness to proclaim it. That's the salvation of the church in that gospel of Jesus Christ brought by the Spirit. The life that he gives of being of one heart and of one soul. Amen. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank thee for thy word this morning. Bless it to our hearts. We thank Thee for the Spirit of Christ who brings to us all of Christ's things and who makes us of one heart and one soul. 
Wilt thou forgive our iniquities, comfort us by the gospel, carried to us by thy spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Sixty-nine. We'll sing the three stanzas of this anthem of the Spirit's work of making us of one heart and one soul. The three stanzas of 369. of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.